Hey guys, Carlo Filippo in here, your muscle chef, ready to talk to you about this guy, the chicken pound. What do we do with the chicken pound? We prepare grilled chicken in different flavors, six to be exact. If you're serious about bodybuilding and your meal prep, don't go anywhere else. This is the company for you. Hey, this is the game Triple H from the WWE. You're watching RxMuscle.com, the truth in bodybuilding. RX Television on RxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition, Titan Medical, Cuts Training and Fitness, Liquid Sun Rays, and The Chicken Pound. This is your 30-minute question and answer show. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, news, rumors, gossip, life, whatever's on your mind, it is all on the table. So we now bring in Dave Palumbo. Dave, yesterday... We launched an interview with Melody Mello, and for fans who are familiar with our show Bros vs. Pros, she competed back when she was, I want to say, 15 years old, and she revealed some shocking details about her upbringing and really having to survive some really, really rigorous conditions, and I think the fans really responded well to it. Yeah, you know, I know Melody since she was... uh... 15 years old when she first contacted me and said she wanted to do bros versus pros and I'm like look you know you're a teenager you're gonna have to get you know make sure you have to bring a parent with you and I didn't know who she was and she drove down with her stepdad little did I know the stepdad was doing all the crazy stuff he was doing that if you listen to the interview you'll know and yeah I became friends with her I used to she used to come all the time to all these events and I would talk to her uh, she would email me you know and so you know, she was almost like like a little uh, like a daughter to me. You know, and it, it was it was shocking to find out all the stuff that went on and what happened to her. And I'm I'm so happy that she's in a good place right now. But I think people are going to really enjoy the interview because it is a it is a really a testament to the fact that you have to be careful. There's, there's a lot of predators out there, and 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 young kids are very very you know vulnerable to adults that are manipulative. And and she's a perfect example of that. But. Uh, once again, she came out of this, you know, on top, and she has a beautiful, uh, you know, kid now, and she's got another one on the way, and I'm very happy for her. So I, I think this interview will be therapeutic in a sense. And she said after she did the interview, it was the first time she talked about it openly like that on a public forum, and I think uh, it, it really helped her emotionally. So that interview, as well as Dave's impressions of a picture that Sean Roden posted yesterday, there was some debate as to whether or not it was a recent picture or from the previous year or from two years ago, but we did get confirmation that it was a recent picture. So check both videos right now at rxmuscle.com and the Rx Muscle YouTube channel. Let's go to the questions. The first two questions, as always, from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. The first question, Dave, when pairing some weaker drugs with tests and rotating them through four to six weeks each, what order would you use them in? Anavar, Winnie, Mastron, Primo, should I use them weakest to strongest explain it doesn't really matter to be honest with you you know um, a lot of people when they decide to use these drugs they try to pick the faster acting ones so they get working faster but it seems like you know you're using oral so they're all going to pretty much get in pretty quickly it, it doesn't matter you know the key is to switch them around so that your body doesn't get used to the same drug over and over and over again and you know you, what you'll find out is once you experiment with these drugs, you'll see which ones you respond better to. Obviously, Winchell is stronger than Primavolin, uh, so you might want to start with the weaker one and then build up to the stronger one to the Winchell. But there's, there's really no right or wrong answer to the question. Second question, again, from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Dave, if I use Anavar for a period of time in place of my TRT, would test receptors become more sensitive once I return to my TRT? You know, if I gave you the answer, a definitive answer, I'd be lying because I don't know, to be honest. I don't think anyone really knows, to tell you the truth, if using Anivar in lieu of testosterone will make, uh, give the body a break to the point where if you add testosterone in, you will then respond better. I tend to believe that the androgen receptors are all pretty much the same and that the different anabolic steroids bind to different configurations in that same receptor. And in, in doing so, activate it in different ways. In other words, you know, maybe testosterone fits perfectly because that's what it's made for and it will fully activate that receptor. Maybe the Anivar will only, you know, activate a certain part of the receptor. I don't really know, to be honest with you. You know, I'm, so I'm speculating here. There might be someone out there who does know or maybe the answer is unknown. 
And that's all we really know is empirically speaking what we see. In other words, empirically means what we're viewing in terms of the result as opposed to, you know, um, seeing what goes on on a molecular level. Uh, um, I don't know if anyone studied it that, you know, severely what an anabolic steroid would do as opposed to just a regular testosterone molecule and how it activates or deactivates that receptor. Let's go to our Instagram questions. If you're not following us, our handle is official underscore RX muscle. First question, Sacked Lon A. Simple one, but I'm sure many fans would like to hear input on this one. Is soreness necessary for muscular gain? Usually when you create soreness, it, you, you wind up be, you know, getting bigger because you're actually breaking down muscle tissue. What I found was that once I started taking anabolic steroids, I didn't really get sore anymore, either or a lot less. So I don't think soreness necessarily is needed to build muscle because I built plenty of muscle without being sore because I got used to lifting heavy weights. But I think that soreness a lot of times is an indication that you maybe had a, a rough workout. Uh, if if you have excessive soreness where it lasts more than you know one day, and that's you know, known as delayed muscle on, uh, onset soreness. That's ne not necessarily a good thing either because that would mean that you're not recovering properly. So a little soreness, what I, would, what I noticed when I had a really good workout is I was fatigued, my nervous system felt a little traumatized, I almost felt like I had a little, the shakes a little bit. And that just let me know that I maximally stimulated my body, you know. And if you if, are gonna be sore like in your leg, say, for four days, and you train on a regular basis, you probably overtrained. Now, if you just start working legs and you've only been doing it a month, you might be getting a lot more sore than if you hadn't done it. Also, some people when they, you know, really will go to from pre-contest to, con to to off season, when they start, you know, lifting heavier weights, they'll be sore initially and then it'll cut back. So, I don't think soreness is necessary to build muscle, but sometimes it's a good indicator that you had a, a tough workout, that's all. Let's go to Sarge at Arms. Your opinion on multi slash micro dosing long ester compounds. Do you feel there's a health benefit to this? Micro dosing long acting compounds. They're so giving long teeny, ester compounds, yes. Teeny amounts every day. Ugh. Once again, I, I think that everyone's out there trying to rediscover or you know, reinvent the wheel. I think we know how these anabolic steroids work, we know how they work best. We've you know, experimented over the last, you know, 40 years and we figured out what the threshold dosages are to build the mu best muscle. If you're looking to build maximum muscle, 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams of testosterone a week is ideal. You know, I've tried every dosage and I think a lot of guys out there probably have too. Uh, ask Boston Lloyd. I don't think anyone's taken more than he has. And so it seems as though that 1,000 to 1,200 milligram mark is the threshold to get the best results with the least side effects. And I don't think we're going to change that. I don't think taking tiny amounts all day long or, you know, doing it every day. I think you're just creating more, um, more, you're creating it, you're making it harder than it really needs to be. And when you do that, people get turned off. No one wants to have to take a freaking shot every single day, much less five shot, little shots a day because you're microdosing it. So once again, you know, when you're talking about long acting esters, Okay, taking small amounts of it is not, is not like taking small amounts of something that releases instantly. Okay, if you told me, hey, you know what, I'm going to take small shots of GH all day long. I'm like, well, there might be some merit to that. I personally, I don't think there is, but, but it would make more sense because GH onset is very quick. But when you talk about a steroid that takes, has an onset of, you know, like a week or two, you know, before it really hits its maximum peak, Taking little amounts all day and not gonna, is not going to change anything. Whether you take it in the morning, in the afternoon, in the night, it, it's all going to get in at the same time, essentially. So, once again, I think people make things more complicated than they need to be. Aesthetic with hands, Dave. Training question. Why is it that I have trouble find, uh, feeling free weight compound exercises like barbell rows, but when I do the same weight and grip on a cable row, I feel much stronger mind-muscle connection in my back? I don't want to ditch the barbell rows, but if I'm not feeling it as much, would sticking to heavy cable rows be more beneficial for back development? Look, Vince Taylor told me, you know, a long time ago, I remember, he didn't tell me personally, but I read an article where he said that, you know, he felt that doing cable curls and, and cable tricep stuff really activated his, his arms better than anything. And this guy had great arms. Now, I, my, my always advice is don't listen to people who have great genetics, but 
he, he was different because he was doing stuff that no one else was doing. I said, you know, I'm having trouble building my arms. He has a long arm too. I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna try to do more isolating cable movements but with heavy weight. And I felt that that worked, and I still to this day do it because I feel the cables work really well. When you're, using, when you're training small muscle groups like biceps and triceps and forearms, using cables can be very beneficial. Now, um, if you did everything you do for back with only cables, I don't think your back would grow as well. And I'll tell you why. Because back is not a hinge joint. It's, it's a multifaceted joint with multiple angles and, and so many different muscles in there. I believe that free weights is going to develop your back much more completely in terms of thickness and full development. So bent over barbell rows. But I think that using the cable and hammer machines for back where you're actually isolating with a pad against your chest, I think that's beneficial to targeting the small detail muscles that maybe you wouldn't hit when you're using the, the, the basic free weight movements um, because you're using you know, large muscle groups and you're, you're cheating maybe a little bit. Uh, so I think there's a place for both. That's why I always used to do pull downs first, bent barbell rows, maybe deadlifts, and then I go to my seated rows, my hammer strength rows, and, and, and movements like one arm you know, dumbbell rows or one arm cable rows that really isolate because there's a difference. There's an isolation aspect and then there's a mass movement, a free weight movement, which is, a, which is really related. The, the fuller development in free weights is related to the fact that you have to balance the bar. When you're squatting, think about it, you're balancing this heavy weight, okay? When you're bench pressing, you have to balance this bar over your chest. Those assistory muscles that do the balancing, okay, they get worked. Those are not getting worked when you're using machines because the, and, and cables because the machine and the cables are stabilizing the weight for you. So once again, there's a place for both. Let's go to Sugar J Fitness 15. Dave, why is L-Arginine not used in pre-workouts nowadays and substituted with citrulline? I've used both and always have better pumps with 3 to 5 G of arginine over 5 to 6 grams citrulline. Yeah, I think it's good to, to, to put both in there, to be honest with you. The, the problem with arginine is if you take it every, that's why I always tell people don't take pre-workouts every day. Uh, the enzyme that converts the arginine into nitric oxide runs out. You can use it up, okay? So if you're constantly taking tons of arginine in hopes of turning it into nitric oxide, after a while it doesn't work as well. Supposedly, supposedly citrulline doesn't have that limiting factor to it, and it should still keep converting. Um, whether it does or not, I'm not sure. My uh, suggestion is don't use your pre-workout every single day. Use it on the body parts you really need it for. If you want to use, get a little kick in the gym on the other days, drink an energy drink. That's all. There's no reason to do a, a, a pre-workout every single day. Do the pre-workouts on the body parts you really need to, to, to really focus on. Maybe your back, your legs, maybe chest. The heavy days, the heavy compound movement days where you're building mass. Use the pre-workout on those days. And the other days, if you really need a, a pick-me-up because you're falling asleep, you do an energy drink. Let's go to Miguelito Hudson. The most extreme measures you've had to take with your bodybuilder clients to get them in shape in regards to diet and cardio. Look, I've done some crazy. I've done three and a half hours of cardio per day for some, some women I've worked with. I've had them on, you know, almost no food. You know, three, uh, four or five meals a day with like, you know, just like three ounces of protein and like, like half a cup of vegetables. Uh, we've done, you know, lots of clenbuterol and Cytomel to like, you know, maximize fat burning. Once again, a lot of times if all that stuff together doesn't work, I mean, and that's the maximum. I mean, that's the extreme, you know, case. It's usually because the person's eating too much food. You know, you know people, I, I found out that never ask your clients if they're cheating, they'll always say no. Because when you ask if someone's cheating, it's like asking your spouse if they cheated on you. You know, no one's giving you, no one's gonna say, yeah, I, I, you know, I cheated. The, most people will not say that. They'll, they'll try to qualify it, they'll try to like justify it. The easiest thing to do is ask your clients to do a food diary for you. Write down everything you eat over the next 24 hours, food, condiments, and liquids, and send it to me. And then I go and I look at it and I always find something wrong. Now, people could be lying on those sheets, but then they're only lying to themselves. So usually people will write down what they did. And sometimes I'm shocked at what people send me. I'm like, are you kidding me? Who told you to eat this? Oh, I was in a meeting, I didn't have time, so I ate a Snickers bar. Well, how, why are you wondering why you're not losing weight if you're eating a Snickers bar? 
It happens all the time, people. I get all the time, and I'm like, I don't understand why you would send me a straight-faced email saying, I don't know why I'm not losing weight when you know you ate a Snickers bar. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's, so it happens. Uh, Mr. G. Norris and a couple of you have been asking about this. Dave did a video yesterday. Uh, it is in regard to Sean Roden. Uh, obviously, there was much conversation between his guest posing appearance a few weeks ago and then the picture he posted yesterday. That video right now at rxmuscle.com and the YouTube channel. Let's go to Poppy Rico 9. Dave, can trenbolone acetate be light yellow colored? I was using a dark orange colored one, but recently switched my source and it provides a light yellow. I suspect it might be fake or weak. You know, color is a difficult thing. Usually the dark, dark ones tend to be stronger ones, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, it just might be that they filtered it more. If you filter the trembolone acetate more, it takes out more of those impurities that, and the more impurities in there, the darker it will look, the oil that is. So, you know, pro I guarantee you if you can filter that thing like, you know, 10 times what it's being filtered now, you would probably get almost all the impurities out of there. You might even make it almost absolutely clear. So I think the reason why we see sometimes a lot of, you know, pharmacy steroids look a lot lighter in color is because that they're used being made in pharmaceutical companies and manufacturing facilities that actually have the right, you know, machines to take out and really filter these things and make sure that they're 100% pure and that they have no bacteria or any, you know, contaminants in them. Um, is it, does it mean that the, this stuff is no good if it's too thin? No, but it just means that, that's, that there is variability in the color. If it's yellow, which we know with Trembolone is, is a yellow color, it's probably fine. Let's go to Cujo, a bunch of numbers. Dave, what causes lower abdominal distension? Is it enormous amounts of GH or food related? I'm dealing with this issue right now. I've since cut GH, lowered protein, and overall food consumption. Yeah, I don't know if that's what it is. I, I would make sure you're taking a fiber supplement like Fiberlize. That solved probably, I'd say, 70% of my, of my abdominal distension issues when I was competing. You know, one of the problems is that I needed a lot of food because I was so, my metabolism was so fast that I had to eat 10, 12 times a day. And when you do that, your stomach sticks out. You know, when I noticed I started using the fiber, uh, at the time I was just using a plain psyllium husk, I was, I was noticing my, my stomach was coming down in size because I was emptying it better. You know, so that, that's, a, that's a huge you know, thing right there. And then you, know, you, gotta, you gotta train your abs. A lot, of these, a lot of guys and girls out there don't work out abs. They think they're gonna get bigger abs if they train them. So they don't train them so they have no abdominal control whatsoever. That's silly to do that. You gotta train every body part. So if, that, if that's something you're doing, then you might wanna get that under control as well. But obviously not pooping is going to make you have distension. If you're eating a lot of food, it's going to make it worse. Let's go to Billy, Billy G. Fit Dave, I know you taper down Clen the final two days before a show to not interfere with the carb up process. Should the same thing be done with T3 if taking 75 MCG a day? No. No, because we don't want to, we don't want to mess with your metabolism. They, for some reason, clenbuterol has a, um, uh, a carbohydrate you know how usually you store clock, you, you load carbohydrates? It, it kind of blocks that effect because what it does is it stimulates the hormone glucagon. Glucagon is the hormone produced in the pancreas by the alpha cells that does the opposite of what insulin does. Glucagon mobilizes carbs from the muscle, so it takes glycogen, store glycogen, and it turns it back into glucose and puts it into the bloodstream. Okay? It seems like clenbuterol stimulates that to occur. Problem with that is you're depleting glycogen stores with clenbuterol. So here you are trying to carb up before a show, and and clenbuterol is, is causing your body to you know raise glucagon and, and liberate these carbs. That's obviously doing the opposite of what we're looking to do. So the last two days, usually a Friday, Saturday between before a Saturday uh, prejudging, I taper back clen to two a day. You don't want to stop it because then you can rebound. Let's go to Smiler Pereira. While on cycle, would it be beneficial? to take cholesterol uh, tablets to help with the negative impact to cholesterol or would it impact muscle growth? I've heard mixed reviews on the impact of medication and gains. Yeah, I, I would not take those uh, statin inhibitors. They're not good for building muscle. Uh, they block the production of steroidal hormones, 
because they block the production of cholesterol, which is a precursor to all the steroidal hormones in the body. So that's not probably a good idea to be using those. Plus, I, I just don't think that they're safe. I think, if look, if you want to lower LDL cholesterol, you take a good essential fatty acid supplement like Omegalyze, three pills twice a day. You take a fiber supplement like Fiberlyze, once to two servings per day, because we know that soluble fiber from psyllium specifically will bind up uh, LDL cholesterol in the gut and pull it out of the body, which, which will thus lower it. Without that fiber there, those LDLs can recirculate back into the system and get reabsorbed. And then once again, now you're raising your LDL level. So we don't want that. So there's a lot of good ways that you can, you can combat elevated. Also taking a, a couple of spoonfuls of macadamia nut oil per day will also lower that. So try to go the natural route, especially while bodybuilding. You know, if you're 80 years old or 70 years old and you don't really work out, a statin might be for you. But if you're disciplined and you're a bodybuilder, you can reverse your cholesterol profiles. Let's go to Excellent 187. Dave, I don't know if you recently saw the spat between George Farah and Elaine Norton on Instagram regarding protein consumption. I'd like to hear your response regarding that and maybe do a rant about which side of the fence you're on. So I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, back and forth between uh, Lane Norton and George Farrow. No, I haven't. I, I, now I'm, I'm, I'm interested to go see, to see what they're arguing about because it sounds like something, maybe we should get an iron debate between them. That would be great, right? We've never had George on. Lane no. we've had on before. Lane loves to argue. He's great. He's like, I, you know, he's like me. Uh, let's get George and Lane on. Uh, contact. <laughs> <laughs> let's go to Mason3724. How would having my gallbladder remo uh, removed affect my bodybuilding diet and drug use? It probably won't affect drug use, but it, you know, not having any bile doesn't digest fats. It just emulsifies them. It makes them into smaller pieces so that, that the lipases, the digestive enzymes, can get to them and, and, and digest them better. So you probably would, you'd still be able to eat fats, you just wouldn't be able to eat huge fat loads per meal. Like sometimes I'll go and I'll eat four tablespoons of mac oil on top of like, you know, uh, some avocados and uh, chicken and rice. And that, that's a lot of fat, it's probably like 100 grams of fat in that meal. You probably wouldn't do well on that meal because you wouldn't be able to, you know, digest it that efficiently. But if you're eating like 20, 30 grams, you know, the most of fat, you'd probably be fine. Once again, the liver produces the, the bile that breaks down or emulsifies the fats. The gallbladder stores it and concentrates it so you wouldn't be concentrating your bile. You'd be just trickling it right into the, into the intestinal tract, which would allow it to work. Just it wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to have a large amount released at one time. It would be like if your hands got all greasy and you only had a drop of soap to use to get rid of all the grease. If, you, if you're very careful the way you do it, you get, the, you get the grease off your hands. But if you have a ton of grease in your hands, one little drop of soap is not going to be enough to get, that old, to get those hands clean. You're going to need more. Some good questions here. See how many we can fit in. You see some uh, your best tips for deep sleep and dealing with transomnia. Yeah, it's tough. Trend below makes it really hard to fall asleep. I used to go crazy. And, and that's really why I developed, believe it or not, Somalize. Because I found that when you put melatonin together with GABA, it, it has a really good synergism. The, the GABA helps you relax and fall asleep. The melatonin keeps you into a deeper sleep for a longer period of time. So if you take, I, you know, I created Somalize obviously for that very reason. If you take three Somalize 15 minutes before bed, after about five to 10 minutes, you'll start to feel a little tingle through your body. That's what I call the GABA tingle. And once that hits, you just lay down and you're gonna go right to sleep, I promise you. It's not, it's not a knockout pill, but it relaxes you enough to fall asleep. And what Trembolone does is it, it, it de-rax, it delaxes, that's not even a word. It unrelaxes you, it makes you stressed out and anxious, and it's hard to just turn your body off. I used to put two fans blowing on my face at all times, and usually close to a bodybuilding show, even melatonin didn't work for me in GABA. I sometimes had to take you know, a, a little piece of Xanax, a quarter of a milligram, anything to help just relax me. But if you use Somalize, I'm telling you, it will work. Let's go to Hopoly Fit. We do get this type of question in different variations fairly often. Uh, Dave, having a laborious job on my feet all day and in the hot sun, sweating profusely, does it make me more catabolic? If so, should I consider eating more and up the water intake, I'm a welder and a pipe fitter. Yeah, I don't think the sun is gonna make you catabolic, but it, it definitely will dehydrate you. 
Um, if you get sunburnt enough, you're going to get... Uh, I, I remember back in 1986, my friend Michael Popkin, Jimmy Serpico, that's another friend of mine, who actually now... He, if you ever saw the TV show Rescue Me, he was the executive producer of that with good friends with Dennis Leary. And another friend of mine, uh, Scott Wharton, who also made, did very well for himself, sold a big company for a couple million. So very successful childhood friends. Uh, my friend Mike and I are still friends. Uh, you know, we talk all the time. He's in Boca. We all went to uh, spring break in Fort Lauderdale. And we stayed at Grandma Selma's house. Not my grandma. My friend Jimmy Serpico's. She was like 80 years old. And we, <laughs> we, were using, we were driving around in her car. And we were out in the sun all day long for like five hours. You know, New York is in the, in the Florida sun. Then we went out drinking that night. We would, the next day, we were so wiped out um, because of the sun. Heat exhaustion. And I think it, the problem is that people get dehydrated. They don't eat enough sodium and, and, and potassium. They don't get enough electrolytes. And then the sun just zaps you. So if you're going to get into the sun or if you're going to be exposed to the sun, don't, get, don't let, allow yourself to go too much. Just get you know 30 to 60 minutes the most exposure. Any more than that, it's going to definitely hamper your performance. Okay, it's not, going to, it's not going to make you not be able to grow muscle. It's just going to hamper your performance because it's going to weaken you. Go to Muscle by Mona. It's a good friend of the show. Dave, any benefits to dim supplementation for women? Yeah, I like it. You know, matter of fact, I have a lot of women use my Testolize product because it contains, not only does it contain dim, which is methane, it contains uh, indole-3-carbonyl. These are all uh, made uh, from or isolated from the crucifer cruciferous vegetables like cauliflower and broccoli. And what they do is they don't inhibit the formation of estrogen. They bind extra estrogen and they pull it out of the body. Uh, so I put it in testolized to help re people reduce their estrogen, but it works in men and women, which is good. It's not an aromatase inhibitor because aromatase inhibitors don't do anything for women. You have to, you can only really block receptors or you can actually bind estrogen to get it out of the body. So this is a very natural way of doing it and it doesn't seem to overdo it. It just gets rid of the extra stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, I tell women all the time, try three pills of testolized twice a day. Let's go to old school Matt. Dave, this might just be me, but I think you're very insightful about life in general. Have you ever thought about making content outside of bodybuilding? I know you make occasional vlogs and have heavy muscle radio, but I'm talking about posts about your philosophy on life, goals, issues, et cetera. Yeah, you know, I just started doing, a, you know, I breed reptiles. Everyone pretty much knows that, mostly snakes. And I just started a daily um, video log for the snakes on uh, Muscle Serpents um, University um, YouTube channel, which I have about 15,000 subscribers on there. And the people seem to love it. You know, I, I do the same thing I do for, for bodybuilding, only for snakes. I'm not, that, I'm not as knowledgeable about snakes, but I don't try to be a know-it-all. I try to just show my stuff I have and give some tips here and there, and, it, and people seem to enjoy it. Uh, it I, you know, and then someone else asked me, well, why don't you do like a, like a daily life blog? I'm like, what am I going to do all this? I don't know. I, I'm, I got phones I'm holding here and there and I'm running around and, I, and I'm, I'm stressed out of my mind. I'm staying up at the four in the morning answering people's emails because I have all my nutrition clients. I, I need more time. <laughs> I need more time. And if the days could stretch to 30 hours, I think I would be fine. So it, it's tough. If I had someone following, if I got Tyler following me around all day, which I'm sure he'd be very bored of doing after a while. He doesn't want to do it. Uh, so if anyone else wants to follow me around with a camera all day and then edit the footage, I'll be more than happy to do it. But I, it, it's very hard. I can't do it myself. I, I start hating filming everything that I do. I just started doing my story on uh, Instagram. You know, I put some, I'll film the studio here. I'll film my kids a little bit just because people seem to like to get the little bird's eye view into what I'm doing. I, you know, I watch, my kids watch these, um, um, like, what's his name? Brian's Toy World and all this stuff. And it's, it's the most ridiculous stuff. It's basically adults playing with toys and, and make up, oh, Hulk will smash the Gray Hulk and the Red Hulk will smash the Green Hulk and, and, and Thanos will shoot his Infinity Gauntlet and Iron Man will block it. And I know I could do all that too. And I'm looking at these people. They got like 20 million subscribers. They're probably getting 100 grand a month from, from YouTube. I'm like, maybe I shouldn't be doing bodybuilding. Maybe I should be doing kids' toy videos. But you know what? I always tell you guys this. Do what you love and you will be good at it. If you, if, you, if you try to do too much of everything and you spread yourself too thin, then you're going to be terrible at it. I really enjoy the reptiles too. That's why I do it. And I wish I could do some daily stuff. But 
you know, I need help sometimes. And if I had someone around who just, just liked doing that kind of, you know, voyeuristic filming and editing, who knows? Down the road, it might happen. You know, you never know. As far as, you know, giving, I try to pepper the RX muscles um, uh, rants and stuff that I do with, with, you know, motivational type stuff as well. It's just, you know, sometimes, you know, people get sick of hearing motivational stuff all the time. But if I have a story like the Melody Mello story, or if I have a story even like the Jason Genova we did, these are people who have overcome adversity and, and have succeeded. That to me is motivational. Whether you think the guy's a goofball or not, it doesn't matter. He's overcome a lot of obstacles and he's making a living for himself. And to me, that, that should be encouraged. You know, that, there's a lot of people out there who are depressed and who, who can't get out of bed in the morning. And if I could help one person be motivated and get their ass out of bed and do something that they like, whether it be as silly as, as uh, mowing the lawn uh, or planting you know, flowers in your garden, do it. Do what you like. I tell people that all the time. Do what you love. Don't worry about what other people think. Don't worry about the pay is. Eventually, you will be successful at it and the money will come. On that note, that will do it for this episode of Ask Day, brought to you by Species Nutrition, Liquid Sunrays, Titan Medical, Cuts Training and Fitness, and the Chicken Pound. For our producer, Tyler Shore and Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.